So, so it is one o'clock and we're, we're going to officially get started. You are tuned in to Art Viewing Adventures, hosted by the Community Living Campaign. And our Community Living Campaign connector, Nikki, um, is here. Nikki, tell us, tell us about CLC okay. and uh, get us started. Okay, good. Thank you, Rodney, and welcome, Joan. I'm so glad we're all here together. My name's Nikki Trezvinia with the Community Living Campaign, and we're a nonprofit organization in San Francisco, and we are dedicated to advocating and giving support and knowing about services for the elderly in San Francisco and for people with disabilities in San Francisco. So one of the main things we've done over several years is try to keep um, elderly neighbors connected with other neighbors. So we started out doing exercise classes throughout different parts of the city. And with the COVID that kind of evolved into all of these online Zoom activities, including Rodney's program, some writing programs, things about health and nutrition, um, ex some exercise programs. There's a variety of things that you can find out about if you want to on our, either get our pit, print calendar by mail from us or we can email it to you and I'll put some info about the community living campaign and our activities in the chat our main events line um, so you can participate in more things like this so this is one of our really popular programs we've been on for a year and a half now um, bringing you different emphasis on uh, different types of art. And it's just been so exciting this uh, summer because we had the uh, featured two different sessions on the Diego Rivera mural, the Pan American Unity mural that's now housed at SF MoMA. And um, that was very exciting. We'll put in the chat um, how you can look at those two programs again, because we were able to record them. But today is also going to be very exciting. So Ronnie's going to introduce Joan and our program today about the art. Um, it's Keith. And um, please go ahead, Ronnie. Thank you so much. Yeah. So thanks, Nikki. We're really pleased to be back here. And Joan has um, been a fellow guide with me at what I like to call the San Francisco unnamed Museum of Art. This is a museum in downtown San Francisco that is known for its more recently created art. And it's um, accessible from the Montgomery BART station, but they're a little shy, so we don't often say their name. Um, and then, but Joan is also a docent with the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. And uh, that's kind of why it's, it's so great that we're having this discussion of Alice Neal, because that's going to be an upcoming exhibition next year. And uh, Joan, I know you're a huge fan of Alice Neal. Um, why don't you go ahead, Joan, and share your slides, and then we'll get started with your presentation on Alice Neal. Thank you. And, and while Joan's doing that, I'll just mention, you know, we do this program every um, second and fourth Monday of the month. So we'll be back in uh, in two weeks with another program. And uh, many of you know that um, there's a great rock history program that's usually on Monday nights, but it will not be tonight. Um, my friend Richie Unterberger, who does those programs, will actually be doing it on Friday night. So Joan, tell us all about this amazing artist, Alice Neal. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you all for joining me today. Um, what is a day off for several people? And um, what we're gonna be doing today is exploring uh, one body of a work uh, done by the artist, Alice Neal. Um, as you can see from the dates up on the screen, um, she, her life spanned most of the 20th century, 1900 to 1984. Uh, the complete body of work, of course, includes landscapes, still lives, scenes depicting the events of the day. But in the interests of time today, we're only gonna be looking at her portraits, uh, a body of work done in the later part of her life that she always called pictures of people. Uh, and as Rod mentioned, um, uh, you can go, um, uh, if you wait, when it comes to the De Young in March of 2022, uh, you can also go on the Met Museum website to um, see some of the other work that we won't be covering. So here on the left, you see a photo of Alice in her 20s when she was enrolled in art school. 
Uh, she married while well, still in art school, very young, and she moved to Cuba with her new husband, who was Cuban. Uh, several years later, she returned to New York City, and she lived first in Greenwich. I mean that. Where that's coming from. Artistic, activity, and then later in Spanish Harlem, and uh, towards the end of her life on the Upper West Side of um, Manhattan. So, from the young girl who started life in the comforts of a middle class home in the suburbs of Philadelphia, we see on the right. Uh, a, a photo of her in 1962, at which time she had transformed herself into a mature woman, actively participating in communist and socialist um, uh, demonstrations and meetings, and uh, a woman who never recognized a social barrier either to love or to friendship. This painting is in the uh, SF MoMA collection, and I can still remember my first encounter with it. It was not just an invitation to look, but really a dare not to. It was that compelling for me. The title is Jeffrey Hendrix and Brian. It was painted by Neil in 1978, and I'd like to hear your initial impressions about this work. If you were passing it, what might you notice? What information might it impart to you? So Joan, I'll, I'll start out by giving you my thoughts on that, but I also am really gonna invite people to either um, raise your hand and I'll call on you to, to share your thoughts, or you can type them in the chat and we'll read them. <clears throat> but for me, you know, the first thing I really notice is how these guys, these two men are making direct eye contact with us. Like we feel really engaged with them. It's almost like we're sitting at that table with them and um, kind of, you know, wondering like who they are, what, what their relationship is to one another. And, um, you know, I just feel really drawn into them. There is absolutely direct eye contact. They are looking at the artist who is working very, very close to them. And she's talking nonstop, which was Neil's um, uh, method of working. And um, you have a number of things that go along with that direct gaze. Uh, one is the table. Uh, you almost feel as though you're sitting uh, at the table engaged in a conversation with them. They are that close. Um, and another thing is the background uh, with a very little um, delineation of a background you're focused on them. Any other thoughts? Yeah, we'd love to hear from other people either in chat or you know, if you want to turn on your camera and wave your hand at the camera, you can do that or um, Paco, go ahead and unmute and share your reaction to this. This painting is so stunning, Rodney. Why is that? Yeah, like people who are chit chat, who are you know like uh, there somebody someone's touching, like uh, his partner too. Yeah, so and this paint so vivid, and there's actually a banana at the crowd. Oh, we missed a little bit of that. And, Paco. Uh, I've always too. Okay, there definitely is. You can sense um, a closeness, not only between the two men, but between the two men and Alice Neal. Um, there is, uh, for one, the mode of dress. You can see that Brian on the left is dressed as though he's comfortable. He's in a a family or a personal uh, situation. He isn't out on the street or in a public place. Um, and so we feel an immediacy that we might not feel um, in another um, uh, mode of dress. Um, there is, again, the close cropping. And then there's the bowl of fruit on the um, table. Uh, and if you look at the way the uh, banana circles the um, 
avocado it might be, uh, you can see that play of Brian's arm going around Jeffrey, uh, who is dressed also in green. So he's, she's highlighting, she's drawing our attention uh, to this. Um, this is really a double portrait, but we only get Jeffrey Hendrix's full name. We don't get Brian's last name, which means that um, usually means that one is more important than the other, names being very important things. And in truth, Jeffrey Hendrix was the older of the two men. He was a very established artist. In fact, he was a professor emeritus uh, of art at Rutgers University and well known. Whereas Brian was the younger, a uh, starting out artist and uh, hadn't established uh, uh, his credentials uh, quite as, as, as much. Um, the uh, Hendrix was a fluxus artist. Uh, this was an art movement that started uh, in the 50s, mid-century, and um, it, it kind of was um, a, a rebellion against the elitist attitude, the feeling that you had to be an intellectual in the know to appreciate art. Um, it was an art style that used a lot of uh, humor. Uh, in uh, its por portrayal. Um, and so uh, I have a funnier definition. I always say it's a fusion of Spike Jones, Gags, Games, Vaudeville, John Cage, and Marcel Duchamp. And please, please, I hope I'm not the only one who knows who Spike Jones is. <laughs> um, hey, Joan, I wanna read a couple of the comments from chat. Uh -huh. so, so Sherry notices the vivid, the vivid green in their connection with each other, the dark circles under the man's eyes on the left, the white on his chest, probably a reflection of a window. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very a, a great ob observation. Yes. Nikki um, notes the man looks sickly with those dark circles under his eyes, which is a very interesting. I think you might tell us a little more about. I think that. Alice, Alice Neal used distortion a lot and she used color in, um, in a very uh, different way, uh, the way she depicted skin. So you can see, for example, Jeffrey has a green, there are green touches under Jeffrey's eye um, and there is different coloring in both sides of his face. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a uh, slide that will give us a better look. But what Alice is doing is not blending colors in, but laying them out side by side. So it's a very astute observation. And what she's doing is allowing them to exist side by side uh, to draw our attention uh, in a way. Uh, and yeah. I do. A couple, couple, well, go ahead, Jim. No, I didn't get the, the rest of the comment. Um, <clears throat> well, that, that was really her comment. There were a couple other things in chat. Um, Nancy says um, she's noting their comfort and intimacy with each other. And Joanne says, feels like they just got up and had breakfast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there's, sure. there's a funny story about this um, uh, painting. Uh, it was, um, uh, they had met Alice at a lecture at Rutgers and uh, driven back to New York City together and talked for hours and hours when they got back to the city. And the next day, Jeffrey recalled that uh, they got a call from Neil's daughter-in-law saying that she wanted to paint them. They should get themselves right over to her apartment, which was her studio as well. And she wanted them there that day. And she wanted them to wear the exact same clothing they had worn the night before. And um, they also recalled uh, with a twinkle of her eye, her placing the bowl of fruit on what is really her kitchen table. She worked right in her studio. Um, and you can sense that closeness uh, between the artist and the subject. 
Um, you can see here also something she began to do in her later work. She's outlining the figures in an ultramarine blue, and you can see it very clearly outlining all around the figure. Um, she rarely overpainted the outlines, and you can uh, clearly see it. Uh, if changes were needed, she would scrape and repaint, but she never completely hid the initial markings she had made um, on the painting. It's also interesting to note that the painting was made only nine years after the Stonewall riots. The riots took place on June 28th, 1969. And so that's a short period of time to when this painting is made, uh, which would have made it a very daring painting of the time. Um, Brian actually died in 1987 at the age of 33, um, only six years after the AIDS virus was first uh, detected by artists in Los, uh, by uh, doctors in Los Angeles, and nine years after they sat for this portrait. Um, I'd like to also add that Hendrix commissioned um, a string quartet, number four, by the composer Philip Glass as a memorial to uh, Brian. But this was a very um, long-standing relationship. And um, I like to point it out because this is a very, um, a very close-knit circle, not only of visual artists operating at this time in New York, but um, artists in the field of dance, music, the intellectual community, they all knew one another. They all interacted. It was a very rarefied um, uh, atmosphere. Now here, um, it sometimes is easier to understand what an artist is doing to evoke certain responses um, uh, in our viewing. And so what I've put up on the left is a painting done by the artist Edward Hopper um, that um, he did in 1963 entitled Intermission. And it's also in the SF MoMA collection. Um, what's interesting is that both of these men had the same teacher and yet the works look um, uh, uh, to my mind uh, as though they're very different. Um, uh, the teacher, um, um, well, take a look at them, first of all, and what are some of the differences you notice? Feel free to speak up. Yeah. For, for me, what, I mean, like for the, for the Alice Neal portrait, we're, we're really like, like I said before, we're really like engaging these uh, two men in there looking at us right in the eye. Whereas with the Edward Hopper, it's kind of like we're voyeurs. We're seeing somebody observing them from a distance. In, in kind of taking them in. Exactly. There is definitely a sense of distance, whereas in uh, Brian and Jeffrey, they are, we feel so close we could reach out and touch them. Uh, that isn't the case with the woman sitting in the chair in the hopper. Um, the sense of space, all that space around her, and we seem so far away. Um, the dress, look at the difference in dress. Um, she is dressed as you would find someone you were meeting for the first time on the street, someone you don't know. Uh, there is a much more intimate feeling in the other. Um, and so by doing these different things, eye contact, use of space, clothing, Treatment of the background, all of that background in the hopper, that expansion of space makes her even more remote, uh, are ways that artists get you to connect or to have a different feeling about the work. Any other comments before we move on? Yeah, I'd love to hear, love to hear what other folks say. I mean, I do, do think like Edward Hubbard is of course associated with portraying kind of loneliness you know, you get the sense of uh, isolated people, um, whereas the Alice Neal, this is definitely not the mood of this 
picture of, of uh, Jeffrey Hendricks and Brian. You know, we feel like we're with them. We feel um, it's kind of a nice scene for those of us who have been through the pandemic to, to be kind of close up with these two other people. And the um, first one looks so intimate and Jeffrey looks so relaxed the way his hair falls to so naturally. Yeah, exactly. Excuse me, you know what? That lady looks like she's watching an, uh, a musical show, literally. Well, she's definitely in a theater, and we have to remember, you know, Alice Neal said that her paintings or pictures of people reflected the times as much as the people, and that's also true of the hopper, because the hopper um, is a period of time when movies are really big in American culture, and everyone is rushing to the theater. And it, this almost looks intermission as though it is a film clip. There is a feeling of it being fixed. Uh, there isn't the movement that you feel in, in the kneel. So indeed, both men are uh, portraying a little, telling a little about the time that they um, are living in. I mean, one thing they have in common is um, the backgrounds are both very simple backgrounds. Very simple, although um, uh, the background in the uh, hopper uh, adds to that feeling of distancing. Yep. Uh, I feel like there's a real story to that um, hopper, though, because I, you know, I, I feel like there's this is a stage show, not a movie, is what I think, and why and I want to know why she's there alone I'm assuming maybe she's a relative or a friend of someone in the cast and she's the first one there but I just I'm, it makes me curious yes it does Hopper has a way of engaging us a different way where we wonder about them we we um, they seem not close but someone that we're uh, almost, I, I, I compare it with riding on a train or a subway or a bus, and you're looking at someone and wondering, and in your mind, what are their, what is their life like? Uh, and I think you're, you're picking up on that, Sherry. Um, uh, very true in all of Hopper's, um, but a definite, a different take. Okay. Um, this is a double portrait. It's entitled Carmen and Judy, and it was done in 1972. And I'd like to draw your attention to the size of Carmen, who is the mother's left hand. Can you see that exaggerated depiction of the hand? It's very elongated, uh, as is the arms. Um, so we would think, Gosh, that's, that's not accurate. Um, um, Neil often uses imperfection in doing her pictures of people. Uh, for her, it signified the humanity of the subject, as well as her own subjectivity in painting them. So um, although accurately uh, rendering the sitter's appearance was one of her concerns, she never strove to get it a, an exact likeness. Instead, she used distortion that was very pronounced, expressive brushwork, you were always aware of the brushwork, and the elimination quite often of extraneous uh, detail. So in this one, you can see that the background is depicted with a series of very simple lines and um, just blocks of color in a sense. Um, she conveyed the inner lives of her subjects and um, the distortion in this picture is especially uh, poignant. Um, and we'll get into that in a minute. But I wanted to point out the skin tones again. You can see that she's laying those colors down side by side, not blending them. And uh, again, there is a variety of color, as many different colors as there is flesh tones. You might consider this a contemporary take on a Madonna and child, as you see in a Christian iconography. And it's an interesting thought because Carmen Gordon, who was Neil's housekeeper, 
uh, is actually cradling her limp, emaciated child who dies a few months after this painting is made. And so when you think about a Christian Pieta with the Madonna uh, um, holding her uh, dying son, uh, you can see the relationship. And uh, that to me makes the distortion of the hand uh, even more interesting because um, uh, it, it, makes, it makes it unnatural or otherworldly in a sense. So something to uh, contemplate. Now, in today's eye, whoops, where did I go? In today's eye, we'd look at this and we'd wonder if there was a question of ethics. Carmen was Neil's employee and to refuse to pose unclothed might have made it a very awkward situation for her. Critics have commented it was unusual for a woman of color to agree to expose her body to an artist in this manner. Privacy is after all, one of the few defenses there is against a poverty uh, and racism. Um, but when I look at uh, Carmen's face, she does not look uncomfortable um, and she's making a direct eye contact with Neil. Uh, which is interesting because when you look at the child, the child is making the same eye contact with the mother. Um, actually, these women shared a lot in common. Uh, just as Carmen is um, cradling her child who will die soon, Neil lost her own first child at the age of one, um, uh, and then uh, she became pregnant shortly thereafter had a second daughter, Isabetta, who was taken away at the age of two by her husband and brought to his family uh, in Cuba where she was raised uh, for the rest of her life. And so um, in a sense, both mothers lost their children and there is that connection uh, and that feeling of trust in the gaze uh, that you may pick up on. Hey, uh, Joan, um, Paco has his hand raised. So Paco, why don't you go ahead and unmute, share your thought or question. Actually, that uh, woman, I'm so intriguing with that woman who's carrying the baby or like basically she's like breastfeeding. Yes, she is. She is attempting to breastfeed, but the baby isn't accepting it, is she? Yes. The baby is very sick and maybe doesn't have the strength or the mother may be very tired and, and unable to produce the milk. But there's definitely something there that you've picked up on, Paco. Thank you. What, uh, June, tell me again, what's the title of this painting? It's Carmen and Judy. Okay. Neil's titles are very simple. They're direct and to the point. Um, I like that. I mean, we get a lot of untitled in, in the modern art world. Uh, exactly. She gives us a little more than that. Just the basic facts, sir. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now, Neil always said that, um, oh dear. Neil always said that, I'm going to, I apologize. Neil always said that um, in doing her pictures of people, she not only was able to uh, tell us something about the people, but a lot about the times. And so um, uh, in this uh, uh, painting, we have uh, a painting on the left that was done in the 1930s called um, Pat Whalen. It was actually painted in uh, 1935. Uh, so looking at this, this painting on, on the left, um, does it illustrate Neil's point of view that she's telling us something about the times as well as the man? What, do, what does the audience think? I, I think it is a very sympathetic uh, portrayal of the subject. And then, you know, we've got the newspaper headline showing us, uh, you know, something about a strike. And so I, it wouldn't be hard for me to think that Alice Neal was sympathetic to, um, to the, the unions and to people 
kind of struggling for um, for their rights um, with the powers that be. Um, we do we do have a comment from Gretchen. She says the hands are always large with very long fingers. So she's noticing that for all of these. So we we the hands are, are very important in the work of Alice Neal, aren't they, Joan? Absolutely. And in fact, in this painting, uh, the hands uh, tell us a lot. Um, when you look at this painting, first of all, he's looking at a copy uh, or on the table is a copy of the Daily Worker, which was the official uh, paper of the um, Communist Party. And um, we can see that this is a rugged man. His hands are clenched. Um, into fists. And these are working man's hands. Look at the, um, the thumb uh, nail that we can see. It's not a manicured uh, hand as is the hand on the right. Um, he's wearing a um, open collar blue shirt. And we still refer to a laborer as a blue collar worker. Um, he's not looking at us. Uh, unlike uh, the earlier work by Neil we saw, he's gazing off deep in thought. Uh, there are furrows in his brow. He looks concerned. Um, definitely someone with some worries on his mind. And if we remember the 30s and the depression and the uh, bread lines, um, she really has zeroed in. Um, something else that she's done in the use of the newspaper is she's given him an, att um, an attribute. Uh, we think of attributes a lot in uh, religious paintings. So for example, um, St. Peter has keys that depict uh, him um, or uh, some saints have wheels. Um, here, what, by giving him the daily worker, uh, she has given him uh, an attribute and he becomes a secular saint. Um, now, the backstory is that Pat Whalen was a union organizer for the Longshoremen of Baltimore, and he was a deeply committed party member. So, um, uh, I think she has captured the man, but she's also captured the time. Yeah, we, we did have a question. Wasn't, wasn't Alice Neal sympathetic with the communist mu movement? Yes, she was. She not only was sympathetic, but she uh, put her body where her mouth was. She literally took part in demonstrations. She was an active uh, uh, member. Uh, and uh, and she would have known Whalen. She knew many of the uh, people uh, in, uh, engaged in politics. Uh, to the right, uh, we have a painting, again, simple title, Fuller Brush Man, that she did in 1965. And so when you look at this painting, how is it different from the Pat Whalen one? Or what does it tell us about the 60s? I mean, I, I'm really struck by the expression on his face. Um, you know, he looks just kind of like, um, he, he, he seems pretty happy and kind of, got. He, he seems like a guy with a lot of spunk. You know, like this is a guy, if you were to run into him, he would have things to say to you. Yeah, you know? he's, he's wide open, isn't he? The jacket is open, the hands are loose, the legs are parted. He's leaning forward, you can see it in his shoulders. And he's talking, he's engaging with us. He's making eye contact. Anything else you notice? Um, we, have, we have a number of comments in chat. So, um, uh, so the comparison of the man, men's hands is interesting, says Sherry. The working man on the left is frustrated and probably scared. The man on the right's hands show long fingers. I wonder what is in his pocket. <laughs> Those are his attributes. His attributes are the things he's going to sell you or demonstrate. And you're right on about the hands. Not only are they relaxed and open, but he has a ring. And look at how manicured his nails are. Uh, and on the left uh, arm, he's wearing a wristwatch. So he is very differently 
uh, very differently depicted, not only in the hands, but in the dress. Any comments about the dress? Um, well, before we get to that, uh, Roger notes that um, the um, someone says that hands on the left, the fist, this is Jane actually, on the left, the fist is outlined for emphasis. So she was really noting like those dark lines around his hands. Yes, and they're in black. In black, not, and then Gretchen- Not, not notes, also green, blue. They're in black, which I think points out um, the black circle around the thumbnail, which might, you know, we associate black perhaps with a little bit of dirt under the fingernails. Uh, who knows, but it certainly draws attention to the hands. Very good point. Joan, it's Barbara. Um, I just want to know that in the 1968, I worked at San Diego Custom Savings Bank, and we had a customer who, who had been a full rush man who had accumulated a million dollar retirement fund for himself. <laughs> um, we were stunned, but that's a, that was a good occupation in it's the a, 60s. It's a lot of brushes. It sure <laughs> is. It was also a time when people were reading Dale Carnegie and colleges were offering courses in marketing and salesmanship. So I think that Alice Neal really has caught uh, the feeling of the time. This is a very um, optimistic look. It isn't the dark days of the 30s when things were really tough economically. Um, uh, and so uh, there is a backstory uh, to uh, the Fuller Brush Man. Actually, he was a refugee from Nazism. And so the feeling of optimism that you see is probably a result of his own life experiences as, as um, well. He came through a literal hell of a war and, um, and then arrived where he was able to um, uh, build a life for himself. And so there was this feeling of positivity um, that I think is very much demonstrated in, um, this, um, uh, in this painting. So an interesting comparison of two people uh, at two very different points in our country's history. Um, Tara has interjected um, something in chat. She says, uh, Hilton Alice said of Alice Neal, more than many of American artists, she had a deep understanding of affliction. She did not use her work to escape it, but rather to plunge further into it, into the trauma of being despised or forsaken. Her comment, Jane uh, Tara's comment, the labor leader has strong working hands. The paintbrush salesman has long, I think he's a, not a paintbrush salesman, but the fuller brush salesman has long affable hands, if your hands can be friendly. He is a survivor. She gets to the root of these people's circumstances. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can see it in painting after painting. It's, it's just, it's one of the reasons that Neil, um, Neil's work attracts so many of us. Um, Paco has, a, has his hand raised. So go ahead, Paco, and unmute. You know what? That man is well-dressed. Yes, he is. He is. Like reading a newspaper, like an SF Chronicle. Yeah. Really? He yeah. has a tie and uh, a nice suit. It's, it's a, a matching jacket and pants. He is indeed doing well, as Jean pointed out. Okay, now there is history of a time, uh, but it doesn't have to necessarily be a history of our country's time or international time. There is our personal histories. Uh, if anyone has dug out an old photo album during COVID and looked at uh, images of yourself at different points in time with different hairdos and different clothing, you'll probably relate um, to this. And so here we have a, a painting uh, where um, we have a uh, a, a woman who is pregnant, uh, certainly um, a moment in time that many of us 
uh, have experienced so in our own personal history. The title of this painting is Margaret Evans Pregnant, and it was painted by Neil in 1978, the last of a series of nudes she did throughout the 60s and 70s. Now, this was a subject previously pretty much avoided in Western art, and even today, um, it is not that common. When asked about the choice of subject, I can almost hear her response. People out of false, false modesty of being sissies never showed it, but it's a basic fact of life. And I can really hear her voice saying that. Um, now, generally, Neil depicted expectant mothers near the end of the pregnancy because their bodies would be the most um, uh, extended and there'd be lots of curves and, and it would be a more dramatic uh, line and curve to capture. Um, but just as pregnancies vary from one woman to another, so do these highly individualized uh, portraits. So pay attention to the faces. Uh, so in some of these, if I could line up a group of them, uh, the women appear to be apprehensive, or they might appear to be alarmed or dazed. Sometimes they're even looking indifferent. Alice played a little trick in this one. Notice that that's a very tiny stool. And this is a woman, eight months pregnant, about to deliver twins. That stool must feel very uncomfortable and as though it may tip over at any moment. And so I think Alice was playing a little with Margaret. Um, she usually seated uh, her subjects in very comfortable chairs in her home. Okay, she also did something that was very different. Uh, she never did preparatory um, drawings. Instead, she painted directly on the canvas, which is a technique used by Van Gogh. So usually if you sat for a Neil picture, you sat and sat and sat, it took forever. But in this one, she did it in the astonishing time of three days, three afternoons. So she was working very fast. And she also, instead of starting with the head, which was her usual uh, mode of operation, she started with the midsection. And um, so she focused in on the distended belly doing broad circular brush strokes. To quote one account, by diminishing the importance and additionally the presence of the head, her painting suggests that the subject's body is simply a container. And in fact, Nancy, Neil's daughter-in-law, who was often the subject of her paintings, uh, shared that opinion. Um, she said that Neil told her about late pregnancy, your body ceases to be your own. You become just a vessel. At a certain point, you lose your own self-image. So it's interesting that she started this portrait in a very different way than the usual uh, procedure. Now, tip for tat. I wanna um, just mention one comment. Okay. Um, but Sh Sherry says the, fa the forward face looks different from the profile face in the mirror. Ah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, because I had almost forgotten to point that out. Indeed, they look different. And how do they look different? Would our uh, uh, listener care to respond? Yeah, go ahead, Sherry, if you want to unmute. Okay. Go ahead. To me, it, she looks like a different person. The hair looks longer. The features of the face look different. I mean, the eyes are so apparent in the forward looking face, which we don't see directly, but she just looks like a different person. You are right on. She does look like a different person. Um, she, uh, uh, first of all, the, the shape of the face is different. It looks as though the hair is different. She does, to my eye, appear to be older. I don't know if you would agree with that. Yes. But it's almost like a before and after. Oh, okay. I don't know. I throw it out for us to discuss. 
but Margaret certainly looks apprehensive, those big wide eyes. And she looks so young. She looks just so young. Um, at, whereas the woman uh, reflected in the mirror uh, looks uh, very uh, different to my mind and, and also seems older. Um, people have also pointed out the way Alice and Neil used the shadows in, in this work, the blue shadows on the wall behind. Uh, and as, as Margaret is sitting there, uh, going through this experience, she's probably wondering, oh, what will my life be like? And am I going to be able to cope with this? And all of the things that many of us went through. So a very good observation. Thank you for bringing that up. You're welcome. Yeah, and, uh, Ro, Ro says Re reflection looks like it could be her mother. So I think a lot of people are, are getting that sense of like it could be an older older woman. Yeah, shadowing it, a foreshadowing. You know, our, our mothers all went through this for, for us and yeah, you know. and now it's your turn. Okay, well now we we get to um, meet the poet, the uh, art curator, the art critic, and the artist John Perrault. And this is a um, picture that Alice did in 1972. Um, and in this painting, she's really countering uh, the historic representation of women as sexual objects uh, for a male gaze. Um, and what she's doing is also challenging the way men were usually depicted, looking very dignified, very in control. And so instead, um, we are presented with an image that is, first of all, humorously, unceremoniously um, depicted, but also very, very frank. Uh, people um, will probably notice his long, hairy limbs and thin frame running diagonally across the canvas, corner to corner. Now, this is a public figure. And actually, um, he agreed to do this portrait um, if she would lend him one of uh, another portrait he wanted for a show he was exhibiting. And he agreed to hang this in the show he was curating. So this guy had a lot of courage. Um, and he, at the same time, he doesn't look particularly vulnerable. He looks very relaxed and a bit complicit. Um, look at the gaze as he stares back at us. Um, he's clearly complicit in what I call an anatomical spectatorship. His pose is relaxed, the legs fall wide apart, and the display of his genitalia is actually dead center on the canvas. The catalog for the Met show referred to it as an egregious demonstration of man spreading, which Perrault himself claimed to have originated. <laughs> when the painting was made, Neil was 72 years old and he recalled she looked like a Norman Rockwell grandmother, but with a wicked twinkle in her eye and a really fiery tongue. How could I have denied a request by my grandmother? Pose nude, sure. Yeah. Um, we have a couple of comments in chat, and then I know Paco has a comment to make, but um, uh, so, so Gretchen notes that the upper body is small compared to the lower torso and head. So interesting proportions there. And then Rose says it si strikes her as similar to reclining nude of a woman. And would that be rec reclining nude? Is that a Picasso? I'm trying to remember which. There's a series of reclining nudes, but uh, I don't know which one, but yes. And, and he is right on uh, in that the body is exaggerated. It's, it's just literally, again, she's, she distorts um uh her images and we've we've discussed that before as we have the color you can see all the different colors uh in addition to flesh color yeah. um, and again she's got except for the bed uh which really 
the pose is so much like so many um, female nudes we've seen. Uh, beyond the bed and a, and a pillow, uh, there is the highlights around his head and very little else. So you're really focused on him, which is where the focus was meant to be. Um, I do want to call on Paco. So go ahead, Paco, and unmute. Oh, you know what? The man is actually lying down in the bed. Yes, he is. Like his arms on his uh, head. Yeah, yeah I, I'd say unlike the uh, the pregnant woman we saw in the last picture, he's very comfortable. Oh, yes. <laughs> he is indeed. <laughs> and then Nikki notes um, she uses that outlining as she used in the first painting. So again, we're seeing that really interesting blue outlining. That blue outlining, he and she does not hide that. Um, Okay, moving on, I, I can see we're running low on time. Um, Neo indeed was endowed with a gift of persuasion because how else would she get Andy Warhol, the master of cool detachment, to put himself on public scrutiny in this manner? This was done in 1970. Uh, Warhol was very sensitive about uh, the depiction of his looks he was sensitive about the way he looked. He thought he had very bad skin, so he didn't like to um, have pictures taken of him. So when you look at this, what are some of the feelings that you get? What's she relaying to us? Well, I'm really struck by, you know, we're looking at um, his chest and, and the scar, and I think, Many of us probably know this, that he had been shot, um, I guess, a couple of years before in the uh, 60s. Right. And, and so it's, a, it's not how we typically see Andy Warhol. It's certainly not how he portrayed himself, as he did many, many times. So it's, it's a very um, honest, I think, depiction of him. Yeah, there is a, almost an otherworldly characterization she's given him. Um, she's using um, the play of the uh, engorged midsection against the thin, thin arms. His eyes are closed. His hands are folded in almost a resignation. It's as though he, um, he has left reality, left the present and is somewhere else. Uh, there's just a, a feeling that he is in another, in another place. Um, the one uh, thing that stands out in this painting are the shoes. Take a look at the shoes. They are glossy, shiny, and um, you can see that it, it's hard to avoid them. They're almost like a headlight. They're so shiny. And to make sure we don't miss them, she has painted a uh, brown around, almost like the shadow of the shoe, if you will. Um, perhaps reminding us that uh, Warhol started his career depicting shoes and they had wonderful personalities. I mean, they were also individual. Uh, and here um, we have that beginning with what may be his contemplation of an ending. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are. There, there are some thoughts in, uh, in chat. So uh, first of all, Linda says it strikes, the painting strikes her as unfinished. Ah, yes, in that there is just the simplest depiction of a couch. It's really just a, a suggestion with a few lines and nothing much else. Um, and what that does is it almost creates a feeling that he's floating. He doesn't appear to be embedded or fixed in place uh, or attached to the ground, if you will. There's a floating sensation, which I think plays into that otherworldliness. Um, the other thing is by not having much in the painting and just a suggestion of a couch, he removed from material objects that we find in life, which was really quite different than Warhol's life. So kind of interesting depiction of the man. There, 
There is a question from Gretchen. Um, what's around his waist? Is that a money belt or a girdle or what? It, it's bandaging and a girdle to support um, a sagging. Uh, that was where he was shot. You can see above the uh, scarring. Uh, between the breasts, and uh, that would be to support his stomach. Um, and then, and, and then, uh, Paco is struck by the shoes. That, you know, very that strike him as very shiny. Yes. Um, it is so brownish. He he says. Yes. Um, Sarah notes he had to wear a surgical corset after he was shot. Um, Gretchen asks, why is the pant leg on the right, his left pant leg, uncolored at the knee? Was the painting unfinished? So another another thing that makes us think it was un, unfinished. Yeah, I, there have been several questions on that, and I was not able to find an answer. Um, Neil sometimes felt she had captured what she wanted to capture, and the rest was extraneous. And it's my personal opinion, and it's my personal one, that she felt she had caught it all in the face, the hands, the body, and she didn't need to focus on the leg or the pant. And so she just left it. And she did that more than once, um, uh, just as she did the enlarging uh, or the distortion of body parts. So um, yeah, I, I don't have another explanation for it. Um, I did want to share this work with you all. Um, it is um, uh, a nude self-portrait that Neil did of herself. And I'd like you to take a minute to look at this because I, it was done in 1980, so she's 80 years old. And I think it tells a lot about the artist. What, what, what kind of a woman is this? What, what can you glean from the portrait? It makes me think maybe she was, she was very comfortable being unclothed. She was very comfortable being herself, wasn't she? Yeah. She was no shrinking violet, indeed. What about uh, her mental activity? What does the painting tell us about her mental state at the age of 80? I mean, we see we see the uh, the paintbrush in her hand, so she. I mean, she's about to bounce out of that chair. She's holding her paintbrush. She has in her left hand a paint rig that she would be working with. She's looking out at us, and she's leaning forward. She's about to hop right out of that chair. This is not some woman who has given up on life. She's going full steam ahead, confident. I mean, when you're 80 years old with all of the sagging and the uh, weight problems, uh, to depict yourself nude takes a lot of guts. <laughs> I, I, it was a gutsy lady. <laughs> I'm struck by the, the fact that she's, she shows us with her glasses on too, shows, shows herself with her glasses on. The better alert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have some good comments in chat. Um, what, what, what Roger just said, uh, Linda notes, she looks very alert and ready to work. Sherry says she looks serious. Uh, Rose, uh, sharp, bright, purposeful. Gretchen, sharp cookie. <laughs> and then uh, Paco says, this is so bright. She is so relaxing, literally. I love that, that chair too. I think the chair looks really cool. It is, it is. And she's, of course, uh, she's done an outline. Of, there's almost an aura ab ab around the back of the figure. But that face is a serious face. Her art was serious stuff. It wasn't a frivolous, uh, you know, thing that she did between uh, raising her children. And she did raise two boys while she uh, was actively engaged, all in an apartment. Uh, so my hat is off to her. And what I love, nobody has mentioned her toes. Those toes look so naughty to me. They <laughs> are just so mischievous. They look as though they're ready to move. <laughs> um, Gretchen notes she seems to use blue a lot, especially in this painting. Love the blue striped chair. 
Yeah, yeah, I don't have an answer for that, but you're absolutely right. And, and the blue outline, which we've mentioned. This image was taken of Neil a few years before she died in um, 1980, uh, uh, she was 84 years old. She lived an unconventional life to say the least, right to the end. She had a wicked sense of humor, a tongue that would make your mother blush. She dared to pursue her art vocation in a genre that was declared dead. Nobody was doing portraits at that time, um, seriously. And she lived to be recognized for one of her talents. So she was a true survivor. She actually lived to see herself being recognized. Um, there are pictures of her appearing on Johnny Carson, which is uh, funny considering that she worked in obscurity for most of her life, just uh, depicting neighborhood children. Um, but look at the smile, engaging. That's such a mischievous smile. And I, for one, can almost hear the laughter. So thank you for joining me. Uh, this is a woman whose story really writes itself. Um, she, it says it all in her work. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joan. Um, it's been great hearing thank about Alice Neal. Once again. Um, my question, I do want to ask you, the exhibition at the De Young of Alice Neal, that is going to be, do you know what month of 2022 that will be in? March. Uh, it's due to come in March. Um, stay tuned because we've had numbers of changes and all, but uh, it, it's supposed to be arriving in March and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, but as I said, you can go on the Met website to see some of the works that were up in the exhibition there. And um, uh, a fascinating artist, a fascinating life story, but the work is just so um, compelling, uh, would be my, my expression. Well, well, I'm seeing a lot of really nice comments um, in chat. And I'm going to go ahead and we'll save them and make sure that Joan gets to see all of them. Joan, great job. This is Joan's um, first time presenting on Art Viewing Adventure. And uh, I just knew this was going to be a lot of fun, and it has been. So thank you so much, Joan. Um, definitely hope, hope to have you back and talk about more, um, more great stuff. Um, and we've got, there are a lot of really exciting exhibitions. Um, we were talking at the very beginning about Judy Chicago, and you're going to be a docent at the De Young for the Judy Chicago exhibition. Um, when I get information on when you're leading tours, I'll put that in my Friday email. If anyone wants to get that, you can go ahead and put your email into chat and I can add you to my email list, which goes out just once a week on Fridays. Yeah, we're doing something great. a little differently uh, in that we are not leading organized tours the way we usually do. But there will be docents in the gallery to answer questions. And uh, But in the... Uh, in the immediate future, it will be docents in the gallery rather than organized tours. So I wanted to make that clear, uh, but there will be someone there to engage in conversation about the work with you. And it's a fabulous show, uh, really a great exhibition. So do make time to see it. I, I'm really looking forward to it, Joan. Uh, my Thank back. You, Joan. Fabulous presentation today. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, pa and that means a lot, Paco. Paco. Paco comes on all of these programs and is our most enthusiastic audience member. So thank you, Paco. It gets the Paco seal of approval, <clears throat> which is much coveted. So thanks for that. Thank you, Joan. <clears throat> Want to wish everybody um, a great rest of your week. And we'll look forward to seeing you back in two weeks. We're going to be talking to our my good friend, Bernice. Iwamoto about stained glass and modern stained glass. So that'll be two weeks from today, October the 25th. So we'll see you back here then. Uh, Nikki, I know you're going to be part of that. And um, I see some folks have put the email into chat. So I'll add you to my email list. Um, but everyone else, um, stay safe and go Giants. Beat LA. Oh, I will see you at uh, Richie's program on Friday, Rodney. See you at Richie's program. Paco, by the way, seems to be wearing a blue Brooklyn shirt. Um, I hope that's not a Dodgers shirt. 
Paco, because uh, we definitely don't like them. But of course, the Brooklyn Dodgers are no. Now, Joan, you got to see the Brooklyn Dodgers. Is that correct? I was an old enough to recall sitting in the stands at Ebbets Field and cheering the Dodgers on. And I remember <laughs> Jackie Robinson's initial appearance and the way he always tipped that hat as he would take the field and the audience would just roar. Yeah, lots of memories. <laughs> yeah, we, we always root against the Dodgers, but that doesn't mean like, like me, obviously Jackie Robinson is, <laughs> is a towering figure in baseball history. Um, so we, we, you know, and Vin, Vin Scully, their broadcaster, another one of the all-time greats. So we, we kind of, we root against the Dodgers, but we kind of also admire them to some degree too. But let's watch them lose tonight. <laughs> oh, we're going to watch Blue Angels. Like Blue Angels? Angels are, uh, are flying over us. Again? I thought they were done. Yeah. <laughs> we had enough of them. Speaking yes. of towering, uh, towering uh, giants, uh, Boomer is moved to Friday. And this week, it's one of my favorites. It's uh, the Latino rock, La Bamba, Santana, all the familiar names if you're from the Bay Area. So that's going to be really a nice adventure for Friday night, just between the games, too. So, yeah, uh, there there's no. Go and join game. us, Nikki, on Friday. I'm going to be there. Yeah. So we hope you join us again with the San Francisco Community Living Campaign, bringing programming like this to seniors, people with disabilities in San Francisco and beyond that. So I don't want to limit our audience, but we really enjoy you having, having you.